Spitzbergen in the summer. About as far north as you can get. Polar bears, midnight sun, vast glaciers. Whether it's on your bucket list or not, what might you actually see if you visited there in the summer? On the map, it's a bit closer to Greenland than it is to Norway. To give a bit of scale, it's 450 kilometers north to south. It's a bit more than a day and a half sailing from the North Cape of Norway, so you'll have a bit of time to adjust. If you're in the main town of Longyearbyen, at 78 degrees north, there will indeed be only a few hundred folk north of you anywhere on the earth. So, what might you see? Quite a bit of it is covered in an ice sheet. And if you like glacier watching from the sea, you're going to be smiling. Perhaps less so if you try to get there on foot, partly because they are retreating and also because of safety precautions. Mountains. Hey, this whole set of islands drifted away from Greenland. There's lots of scree and scarring from eons of glacier movement. And the sun. Well, it's always there. Or it's not there, and it's really difficult to describe. Historically, people in Spitsbergen primarily are there for the coal mining. And there are a few hardy souls sticking around for hunting and trapping. The museum and the science center in the town is well worth visiting to find out more about that. The artifacts from mining are scattered around the town. And wildlife. Those tens of thousands of barnacle geese you see on the Solway Firth... Well, this is their home. And yes, there's a good chance that if you go looking, you can see some whales. What you won't find? Mm, trees. No, serious guys, this is tundra. Not much chance of a traffic light. And there's one big shop. Kind of like Greenland villages, it sells everything. Seeing that bright thing well up in the sky due north at 1 o'clock in the morning is one of those adjustments that works better if you take a bit of time traveling north and get used to the idea. If it's cloudy, well, things look just about the same any hour of the day. 4 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, doesn't matter. Evidently, the locals have the most trouble in September and March, where the day length changes by several hours in a week. A bit of history. An American, John Monroe Longyear, guess the name, started coal mining here in 1906. The Norwegians and Russians followed. Unlike many other places in the world, mines are dug horizontally into the side of the mountains. In this case, an aerial tramway was set up to get the coal to the coast. The towers and other infrastructure of the tramway are still dotted around the town, well worth walking up the valley to see the ruins of the original mining settlement as well. As you walk along, you begin to appreciate the tundra you're walking over and the vast quantities of scree tumbling down the mountain. And this is an ongoing process. <laughs> when you first arrive in Longyearbyen, most visitors would view the town as starkly functional. It hosts the infrastructure needs to keep around 1,500 folk alive in rather harsh conditions. It's in transition from being a company coal town to something else. And that something else involves hosting an increasing number of visitors. There are information displays and maps in quite a few places. And for most visitors, the first thing they want to do is take that obligatory selfie of the polar bear warning sign. Chances of actually seeing one? Not so much. But it's a serious fact of life the locals have learned to coexist with. Everyone living here must be competent with a rifle. Folk tend to leave cars and doors unlocked so that there are options in case one of those giants comes into view. Anyone venturing past the warning signs must be either trained and armed or guided. We went on a fossil hunting party. There were 20 of us and three armed guards. 
Granted, fossil hunting is hard work. You need some really serious boots to get up through the rough terrain as you head up the valley and reach the terminal moraine of the glacier. In that jumble of rocks, you just might spot the tracks of reeds and leaves. If we go back down into the valley, that runoff from the glacier splits the town. Of course, being really far north and being cold a lot of the year tends to form permafrost. And as with settlements in Greenland, what you notice when you walk around the town is pipes. They're above the ground, and the buildings tend to be built on stilts. When it's not summer, getting around tends toward quad bikes and snowmobiles. And just outside the town, you might see the alternative. Lots of working dogs. Ooh, take me, take me. <laughs> They're multi-level living quarters and ability to jump around. That, that was actually quite a surprise. And here's an interesting merger of the old and the new. And the other thing you might find when you're walking around town are geese. In the summer, you might also see the next generation munching away at the tundra. And when they decide the grass is greener on the other side of the road, well, traffic stops. Back to the glaciers. There are two massive glaciers further up the fjord. Their scale is beyond words. If you're lucky to get close, then you'll begin to see their complexity as well as the blue of the older ice. Those dark tracks you see are the moraines marking the joining of separate ice flows further up the valleys. And Wales. We were lucky and caught sight of the white bodies of beluga whales. And on the way north, our treat was a pod of fin whales. In joy.
Humpbacks are also a possibility. In this case, extreme range. Serious folk have lenses the size of their legs. So, Spitsbergen is a place with a landscape on a grand scale. It's also a tough place to do business. The Pyramid in Coal Town is an example. It's been a ghost town for decades. And being part of Norway, there are folk that don't like living in towns and seem to prefer isolated cabins. On this island, there's a long tradition of hunting, trapping, and remote locations, and perhaps this cabin is following that style. And when you get back into Long Yerbien, if you've got the time, make sure to visit the world's most northerly brewery. They have a really interesting story to tell about how they made it happen, and the beer's not half bad. And as you leave, again, you'll have to adjust to that sun. <laughs>